Good morning, Mount Calvary. Let us give praise to the praise team for that. Beautiful. On today, we will be continuing through the series that our senior pastor has been preaching for the last month or so. And just to give you a brief recap, in the first sermon of this series, Pastor Dennis preached, why are you hiding? And it was from Judges chapter six about Gideon and the Israelites and how they made hiding places for themselves to escape those cruel Midianites. And Pastor gave us several key points to remember. Number one, he said, it's time to come out of hiding because God has given you a new purpose. You can sit down. We, we ain't there yet. Y'all can sit down. God bless you. He said, number one, he said, it's time to come out of hiding because God has given you a new purpose. Number two, he said, God's presence will be with you. Three, he said, God wants to prove to you who he really is. And last, he said, God wants to give you peace. Next, pastor preached, why are you doubting? From a very familiar story in Matthew 14, where Jesus, after he had fed the 5,000, he sent the disciples to the other side of the lake on a boat while he sent the people home and there came about a great storm. Then the disciples saw Jesus coming toward them, walking on the water, and they were terrified and thought they saw a ghost. When Jesus spoke to them and told them not to be afraid, Peter asked Jesus, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And when Jesus said, yes, come, Peter went over the side of the boat and began walking toward Jesus. But when, she, when Peter saw the strong winds and the waves, he became terrified and he began to sink. But Jesus reached out and grabbed him and he said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? But pastor assured us that doubt is a part of the journey to our development. We doubt because we are human. Then the last sermon that pastor preached was, why are you running? From the first chapter of Jonah, he spoke about how Jonah was disobedient to God and he ran away thinking he could outrun God. Pastor told us that God said go and Jonah said no. But we can't run from God and we can't hide from God. Pastor reminded us that sometimes we are living in someone else's storm. We didn't create it, but it was created by someone who we were connected to. He said the sailors realized their deliverance was connected to their ability and their desire to connect from Jonah and that the gods that they had been praying to were the wrong gods. Now that's the kind of statements that make you go, hmm. Well, this morning, Pastor has given me the opportunity to preach the fourth installment in this series, and I will be coming from the book of Psalms, chapter 43. And the title of this message is, Why Are You Discouraged? If you will please turn with me to Psalm 43. Again, that's Psalm 43, and I'll be reading verse 5 from the New Living Translation. And it reads as follows. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, your will, not my will. I pray, Lord God, that you will reach into this body, Father God. Move Yolanda out of the way, Father. Allow them to hear and see only you. God, we thank you for this preaching moment, and we just ask that you be with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
I encourage you in your time to read this psalm. It is only five verses, so you can read that, but take your time reading through it because each verse has significant meaning. But the writer starts here with the statement, why am I discouraged? The Hebrew word for discouraged carries with it the idea to be depressed, to sink, to be brought low. Depression, according to the Mayo Clinic, is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness or loss of interest. We know that many people, Christians and non-Christians, have experienced depression or are currently experiencing depression. Ask your neighbor, have you ever been depressed? The psalmist in today's text was experienced depression. And he may have felt discouraged because he wanted God to declare him innocent. In verse 1, he writes, declare me innocent, O God. He apparently was dealing with some people that were making false accusations against him. He needed the Lord to vindicate him, to prove that he was not guilty of whatever it was he was being accused of. Have you ever been there? Did you want the Lord to show up in your situation and declare you innocent? If you have, turn to your neighbor and tell them, I have. Turn on the other side, tell them, yes, I have. Well, in the book of Genesis, we find a story about a man named Joseph. The Bible says that Joseph's father, Jacob, loved him more than any of his other children. And Joseph's brothers knew this and they were jealous of Joseph. The brothers hated Joseph so much that they made plans to kill him. But one of the brothers, Reuben, convinced them not to kill him, but to throw him into a pit instead. And Reuben intended to go back and rescue him later on. But when a group of Midianite traders came along, they decided to sell Joseph to them, and they cooked up a plot to dip his robe, remember his robe, not just any robe, but it was a special coat of many colors that their father Jacob had gifted to him. Well, they were going to dip that coat into the blood of a young goat and then send it to their father to convince him that Joseph was dead. When those traders arrived in Egypt, they in turn sold Joseph to Potiphar, who was an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar saw how successful Joseph was at everything, and he recognized that the Lord was blessing Joseph. So Potiphar put Joseph in charge of everything in his house. And just as everything was going right for Joseph, then along came a problem. Somebody say, a problem. See, the Bible says that Joseph was a very handsome, well-built man, and Potiphar's wife began lusting after him. Have mercy. And she decided she had to have him. Now, as a side note, let me distract for a minute. Some people think the Bible is boring and that it's full of these and thou's and thou shalt, thou shalt not. But the Bible has some juicy stories about some of the same things we see happening today. So I encourage you, can anybody agree with that? If you agree, just tell somebody, read your Bible. Read your Bible. All right, let me get back to my point. But when Joseph refused to sleep with her and he tried to run away, she grabbed his cloak and then she lied to her husband and said he tried to rape her. I don't know if you've ever been in any trouble, but sometimes you need to run when you see trouble coming. Anybody got their running shoes on today? If you see trouble coming, you just need to run. So Potiphar had Joseph thrown into jail, and I believe Joseph needed God to declare him innocent. And the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph, and he showed him favor. Remember, the Lord will fight for you. No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. The Lord will intervene, and he will protect you when the forces of evil threaten to overwhelm you. 
Isaiah 59 and 19 assures me, and I hope it assures you, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. That means the spirit will come in like a mighty river in flood stage, driven by the wind of the Lord, and he will fight for you. He will fight for you. Does that make anybody excited that the spirit of the Lord will fight for you? You do not have to defend yourself. The Lord will fight for you. Okay, maybe you need more evidence that the Lord can declare you innocent. Isaiah 41 and 10 says, the Lord says himself, don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. King James Version says he will uphold you with his righteous right hand. So God will hold you up when you can't hold yourself up. God will pick you up when you fall down. God will vindicate you and declare you innocent when others declare you guilty. Point number two, the psalmist may have felt discouraged because he needed the Lord to defend him. He writes, defend me against these ungodly people. These were wicked people. They were unfaithful and they were disloyal to God. He knew that he didn't have the power or the strength to defend himself against their attacks. Whew! But he knew the one who did. Does anybody know the one who can defend you? God and God alone has the power, the strength and the authority to defend us from ungodly people. When God appointed Moses to lead the children of Israel, Aaron and Miriam were criticizing Moses and they began to question his authority. And then they asked among themselves, has the Lord only spoken through Moses? Hasn't he spoken to us too? That was the wrong thing to do because the Lord heard them and he became angry and he caused Miriam's skin to turn as white as snow with leprosy. Moses didn't have to say a word. The Lord defended him. Uh, I tell you, you better be careful what you say about God's people. They might not hear you, but God hears all. He sees all and he knows all and he will defend his people. The Lord is a very present help in times of trouble. My Bible tells me I will lift up mine eyes unto the hill from which cometh my help. All of my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes before you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The songwriter writes, he may not come when you want him, but he is always on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Does anyone know him to be an on-time God? Has he ever stepped into your situation right on time? Has he ever delivered you from your situation in the midst of it when others said you couldn't get out? When others said you wouldn't be nothing, did God step into your situation? He stepped into some of my situations and he made some things change. He changed some people. He, play, he changed some attitudes. He changed my attitude. God is an on-time God. Yes, he is. Next, the psalmist may have felt discouraged because he needed the Lord to deliver him. His third statement reads, rescue me from these unjust liars. So he is dealing with not only people falsely accusing him and wicked people attacking him, but now he's also dealing with unjust people, people who are evil and morally divert, perverted, liars that will say anything but the truth. You know anybody like that? We won't go into the politics, but we talked about it in Bible study on Thursday. We know some people like that, that there is no truth in them. So because these people are wicked and they're perverted and they're evil, 
the psalmist needs the Lord to deliver him. Remember the story about Joseph we just talked about when he was put in jail based on the false accusation of Potiphar's wife. And while he was in jail, the king's cupbearer and baker were also thrown in jail because they had angered Potiphar. I'm sorry, because they had angered Pharaoh. The Lord had showed Joseph favor, though, with the captain in the jail. And the captain had assigned the cupbearer and the baker to Joseph so that he could attend to them. The cupbearer and the baker had some dreams. And after Joseph had interpreted their dreams, he had asked the cupbearer to remember him and mention him to Pharaoh when the cupbearer was released and restored from prison. But the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. Have anybody ever forgotten somebody asked you to pray for them or to remember them? Did you ever forget and then you felt bad about it maybe later? Hopefully you went back and prayed for them at that time. Well, Joseph needed the cupbearer to remember him because Joseph needed the Lord to deliver him from prison. But after being forgotten and Joseph had spent a few years in prison, Pharaoh had a dream and none of the musicians or the wise men in all of Egypt could interpret it. Then the cupbearer remembered Joseph and he told Pharaoh about him and how he had interpreted the cupbearer's own dream. Pharaoh called on Joseph and he explained how he was told that Joseph had the power to interpret dreams. But Joseph corrected him and he told him he didn't have the power, God had the power to interpret those dreams. Anybody want to give God credit for interpreting dreams, for giving us vision, for honoring our dreams? After the Lord had allowed Joseph to interpret Pharaoh's dream, Pharaoh made Joseph his second in command over all of Egypt. God has set up Joseph's deliverance because Joseph was faithful to God. Do you know anyone here, anyone online, who needs the Lord to deliver them? Are you going to be faithful to God in that delivery? Psalm 34 and 17 reminds us, says the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Psalms 107 and 6 says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. The Lord will deliver you just like he delivered others in the Bible. Do you remember how he delivered Daniel in the lion's den? Anybody remember how he delivered the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace? Our God is a delivering God. Yes, he is. Does anybody in here need God to deliver them right now? Give God some praise. The fourth point. The writer may have felt discouraged because he felt like the Lord had deserted him. He says in verse 2, why have you tossed me aside? Has anyone ever felt tossed aside? Maybe you were trying to do everything right, but no matter how hard you tried, you still felt abandoned. You felt like you didn't see God stepping into your situation. And you were looking, you were praying you were trying to be faithful, but you couldn't see help coming anywhere. True story. My son is a mortgage loan originator out west. And in today's economy, the mortgage business is a tough one to be in right now. So he's been working really hard to make more connections with new realtors. And I'm saying this not because he's my son, but it's a true statement. He's one of the kindest caring people that you would ever meet. And he would do anything for anybody. So he went to this open house with this realtor on a Saturday that he had connected with. And she had asked him to work it. She had also told him that she asked him to dress down, to wear a t-shirt, shorts, so he could be comfortable and casual because it was gonna be 116 degrees that day. Somebody say, oh, that's hot. That's hot. After the open house, he got a message on Facebook from this realtor. And the homeowner 
apparently had posted a picture of him online from their security camera, and this homeowner asked the question to his assuming followers if that was appropriate attire for a lender at an open house. The owner went on to say that he himself had been a lender for over 30 years, and he used to wear a suit and tie every day. And he wanted to know how he should respond to his realtor who had invited this young man to work the open house. This homeowner was trying to publicly ridicule him and was looking for supporters. Cyberbullying, anybody ever heard of that? Do you know any cyber bullies that will attack you from their keyboard but can't say it to your face? You know, our vice president said, you got something to say? Say it to my face. Well, as you can imagine, my son was immediately concerned and he felt like he had been abandoned, like he had been deserted. He was worried about the impact and what would happen next. And as we all know, bad things can happen to good people. But God. Let me say that again. But God. No sooner had he seen that post, his realtor jumped in to defend him. She said, that's my lender. And she's told how hard he works to support his family and that he goes out of his way to help her, knocking on doors with her, sitting at open houses with her so she's not alone, going out to purchase treats and water for her, for her clients so she doesn't run out, and how his T-shirt was not just any T-shirt, it was a branded company shirt. But she said she stopped wearing suits many years ago because her clients want to meet with people who are relatable. And she says she sells to high-end luxury clients. She also mentioned that maybe there was a touch of something else in this homeowner's heart. We won't even go there. She mentioned that she had been seeing my son all week at programs for self-improvement, programs that provide ideas for growing your business, other programs dealing with current industry news. And so she wanted to promote him to others who would read her post challenging that homeowner. She said she would gladly send his phone number and his name to anybody that wanted to help him or anybody that needed him to help them. Because if they were looking for someone to work hard, he was their man. She said that people should celebrate that people do business differently today. We can look around this church. Is everybody in a suit and tie? No, people are dressed more casually in today's environment. And she wanted this homeowner to recognize that it's not 30 years ago. Today is today and times have changed. Remember I said when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Well, the comments started coming in like a flood from people supporting him and shaming the homeowner, people encouraging him to keep doing what he was doing, praising him for the sacrifices he was making for his family. After all, he was working on a Saturday when he could be at home with his family. They also had comments from executives and others that worked at his company that saw his branded T-shirt that supported him in his efforts. And, and they said they do the same things. It was even great to see that his CEO of the company posted and called this guy a loser that made the comments and said he was gonna give him a raise, my son a raise for his hustle in 116 degree weather. Look at God. God turned it around for his good. The Lord is truly blessing him through this situation, he has been offered a complimentary virtual assistant. Yep, that's what I said, free. He's been offered a free virtual assistant. He's got new realtors sending him messages wanting to partner with him. One of his company executives wants to send a limo this week to pick him and his realtor up to give them a personal tour of his office and to discuss ideas to generate more business. All I can say is look at God, because when this man discouraged or made an attempt to discourage my son, Mama Bear came up. 
Mama Bear was ready to go. Plane, get me there, okay? But I said God loves him better than I do. God gave him to me, and I know God will defend him. So praise God that he settled me down, and he took over. So God showed up so that he would not feel like he was left out there alone. He was showing up, letting him see that people were coming to support him. They were thinking of his well-being, knowing that he was doing all he could to make it right for his family. So we know that God can and he will use anyone or anything, even your enemies, to bless you. Maybe you didn't hear that. Let me say it again. God will use anyone or anything, even your enemies, to bless you. God will show up when you're feeling abandoned or deserted. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. The King James Version says he will never leave you nor forsake you. And even though all these things can make us feel discouraged, the writer goes on and he's asking himself these questions. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? He's asking himself, how can I overcome these emotions? And he decides he is not going to be stuck in his discouragement. So he offers himself these solutions. One, he's going to have expectation. He has hope in God, and he is expecting God to show up. He expects God to perform a miracle in his situation. That's how I felt. When this happened, I was like, all I can say is God will show up. He has never left me. He has never abandoned me. When I've prayed and asked God for something, he delivers every time. It might not be the way I expect it, but he always answers. And I am thankful and grateful that I serve a miracle working God who will never leave us, who will never forsake us, who will show up in every situation and he will work it out for our good. Psalm 40, 62 and 5 and 6 says, let all that I am wait quietly before God for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. Two, the writer said he's going to give exaltation. He says, I will praise him again. I will praise him again. He remembers what God has done in the past. So he is willing to praise God in advance for what he is expecting him to do again. Does anybody have an advanced praise, a praise of expectation, a praise of exaltation for what God's going to do in your situation? <laughs> Praising him for you know what he did for you before, so you know he can do it again. I'm going to praise God because I know if he brought me out before, he can bring me out again. If he did it last week, he can do it today. If he did it last year, he can do it today. It might have been 30 years ago, but he can still do it today. And I am a grateful person, thankful for the mercies of God. Psalm 34 and 3, 1 and 3 reminds us, says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Come on, church. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. For he is worthy of our praise. We serve an awesome God. If anybody in here knows you serve an awesome God, give God some praise. The writer says, number three, he's going to put emphasis on God. The psalmist reminds himself of who God is. He says, my savior and my God. He acknowledges that God is Elohim, the supreme God, the one who can do anything but fail. 
First Chronicles 29 and 11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. God is head over all. No matter what the world might think, God is still in control, and God is head over all. In Colossians 1, 15 and 16, says Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, and he is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we cannot see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. The psalmist remind, reminds me and hopefully reminds you that there is nobody like our God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is God and he is God all by himself. There is nobody like him. He will fight for you. There is nobody greater. Let me say it again. Here is nobody greater. Nobody greater than our God. He can declare you innocent. He will defend you. He'll deliver you. And he will never desert you. The songwriter said, if I just hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battles, victory shall be mine. Victory shall be mine. I will not be discouraged. Come what may, I will worship the Lord in all things, whether I'm up or whether I'm down, whether I'm in the valley or whether I'm on the mountaintop, whether I'm turned around, it is well with my soul and victory shall be mine. Does anyone in here today have a come what may testimony in their spirit? Come what may, I'm gonna expect God to move in my situation. Come what may, I'm going to expect God to declare me innocent. Come what may, I'm going to praise God for delivering me. Come what may, I'm gonna praise God for defending me. Come what may, I'm going to celebrate that God said he would never leave me nor forsake me. Come what may, Jesus died for me and for you. He rose again though on the third day with all power in his hands. Come what may, there is nothing too hard for God. Come what may, he will make your enemies your footstool. Come what may, the spirit of the Lord will come in like a flood and lift up a standard against the enemy and he will begin to surround you. You are surrounded by God. He will surround you and come what may, my answer is still yes, Lord. Come what may, my answer is still yes, Lord. Come what may, my answer is still yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, come what may, I will serve him. Come what may, I will praise him. Come what may, I will give him all the praise. Come what may, I will magnify the name of the Lord in every situation. Come what may, because I know if he did it before, he can do it again.